Okay, guys, so sorry. This is taking me a little bit longer to record um, than I had anticipated. But what we're going to be doing is this is a, an important lecture. It's a lecture that we would have had last Friday that I did give you off due to the fact that you had your med surge and it was kind of a nice little um, mental health surprise day for you. So I hope you enjoyed it. And the good thing about the timing of all of that, which made it work is that we have two days that we're doing addiction, which allows us to do that. And the first part really is more foundational because you had so many assignments on it. Plus you have your, um, on top of that, the assignments for seminar. So I felt it just made sense. So at this point, there have already been a lot of, um, of your assignments done. So you have some foundation and now we're going to build on top of that. And this is all going to correlate because your next quiz that is um, the week that we're doing bipolar. So not this week, but next week all goes with what I'm going to be talking on this video. And I think I made an announcement on that yesterday, but I will make sure if not, I will. So um, this video is only a about, I would say going to be, I'm, I'm shooting for about 35 minutes. So um, I do have the study guide up as well. So I'm going to, um, for the quiz so that I uh, make sure that we review everything and it will hopefully be a nice kind of just uh, foundation, extra foundation on top of what you've been learning. So we're going to start with three NCLEX questions. And the reason I'm doing the NCLEX questions, um, in the video is because it is part of the quiz that will be, um, like I said, when we, the week we do bipolar, which I believe is next week. And um, that way we don't take away time for tomorrow and um, you can watch this in your own time or not tomorrow, Friday, whenever that is. <laughs> so we're going to, there are three NCLEX questions. And as you can see on your study guide, it says that there are to make sure that you understand the, the three NCLEX questions. So we're gonna go over them as we would in class. Number one, the nurse is assisting with discharging a client from the inpatient alcohol treatment unit. Which of the following statement by the client's wife indicates that the family is coping adaptively? So what this question is asking me is as the nurse, I need to be able to assess what is showing me that um, the wife, including the family of this person who's coming home from an addiction facility, that the family is adequately coping. So let's go ahead and start with letter A. My husband will do well as long as I keep him engaged in activities that he likes. Okay. Um, and for this one, I'm going to actually read them all. Um, it, it just kind of makes, it's a little bit easier for me to uh, explain that way. Uh, letter B. My focus is learning how to live my life. Letter C, I am so glad that our problems are behind us. And letter D, I will make sure that the children do not give my husband any problems. Okay, so I think there's a few that probably stood out where it's like, uh, well, and, and it kind of depends. So for me, because I deal with addiction so often, I don't want to speak and just say that because maybe it doesn't. If, if you really don't have a lot of experience in it, some some of these might not be um, a red flag. So let me take that back. So looking at these questions, um, what I do see right away is that letter A and that letter D are, are kind of similar because it's basically saying that you have control and, you know, I will make my husband will do well as long as I keep him busy. Well, it's not the wife's job. And that's what's called codependency and enabling. So these are things that we don't want to do support is different giving support like if it said something like joining um I look forward to, forward to joining my husband in therapy so we can try to repair a marriage or something like I mean that, that's different that that's support this is hey I'm going to control things or make sure that everything's perfect in order for my spouse not to relapse basically and that's what letter a and d are doing it it, it has codependency and enablement in number in letter A and then letter D, I mean, how can you make sure of anything, right? So you can't absolutely make sure that your children are not going to give your husband any problems. And on top of that, even to think wider is we can't control the world as well. And then letter C, I am so glad that our problems are behind us. That is what I would call kind of, um, 
I don't like the words wishful thinking, but our problems are not behind us. This is addiction. Um, there's a high chance of relapse within the first year. And if you had to pick a best answer and you'll see a C and D have more, their more commonality and B sticks out. And this one students don't tend to go for usually first because it kind of sounds weird. I'm going to, so the wife is saying my focus is learning how to live my life. And that is actually the correct answer. And the correct answer again, being there's no enabling there, learning how to live their life because after years and years of, or we doesn't give that information, but having to deal and, and take care of, and it's now time that I'm going to take care of my life. So really in the, if you were to look in the book, where I got this question, it talks about, we're not enabling, we're not giving false reassurance and, um, we're not having wishful thinking. That's kind of where they're coming from. So number one would be letter B. And again, um, hint, hint, go over these three NCLEX questions, please. And know them. I'm explaining them to you, but understand them, please. Number two, a client with a history of alcohol use disorder is transferred to the unit in an agitated state. He is vomiting and diaphoretic, sweaty, and says that his last drink is five hours ago. The nurse would expect to administer which of the following medications. Well, first and foremost, what's going on with my patient? It looks like my patient is going into alcohol withdrawal. That is not good. There is, it's safe. I'm sorry, unsafe. (laughs) And we want to definitely make sure that we um, help our patient to feel more stable and to prevent seizure. So which one of these medications, A, Librium, B, Antibuse, C, Methadone, or D, Naltrexone? And I'll tell you the Antibuse, Methadone, and Naltrexone are all anti-craving medications. Um, Antibuse is the, um, we'll talk, I talk more about that in the medication video, so I won't talk about that here. Um, But A is a benzodiazepine. So the classification of Librium is an anti-anxiety. The um, specificity of that would be a benzodiazepine, which falls into the same category as Ativan, Clonopin, Xanax, um, Valium, that type of medication. And Librium is, I would say, one of the most common ones they use in the hospital. You'll also, as um, I've mentioned before, I believe, you'll see Ativan, usually Ativan, Valium, or Librium if they're using a benzo. And that's what you need to know for um, this question. So a patient going into alcohol withdrawal, and we want to give Librium, um, not an anti-craving, we want to give Librium because Librium is going to help prevent a seizure, which is about safety. And that is extremely important. And then for our last one, for this one. Okay. So number three, the nurse is reinforcing teaching with a client who's scheduled for a paracentesis. Which of the following statements by the client indicates that teaching has been successful? All right. So we are looking for a correct answer because it's asking which one of these indicates after I give my patient teaching that they understand what's going to happen in the procedure. So I'm looking for something right, um, not something wrong, because sometimes they say needs further education, right? So that's always important to differentiate there. And then um, what knowing what a paracentesis is would be extremely helpful. Um, most of you, I believe we may have gone over this, but if we haven't, I'm going to just in brevity give a quick little um, synopsis of what a paracentesis would be. So with somebody who doesn't have a liver that is um, working and functioning properly, unfortunately, and I, I, I can get way into the details, but I'm going to keep this um, superficial for this video. Um, a paracentesis would basically Uh, or sorry, um, when your liver's not functioning properly, your liver's not able to make enough albumin and albumin, and this can happen for several reasons in this certain circumstance, we're talking about alcoholism. So that would be, let's say somebody has a fibrotic or cirrhotic liver. If their liver's not functioning properly, it's, it's not going to be able to keep up with the functions that it has. And just as a fun fact, the liver has about, um, over 500 functions that it does. It's very important organ. And so if it's not able to um, produce enough albumin, unfortunately, what albumin um, does is albumin is our largest protein in our body. And in essence and in simplicity, it helps to keep uh, fluid in our different compartments where they're supposed to be. So if you don't have that, and that's one reason why why they will draw your um, labs and they don't just do AST, ALT, 
they do a bunch of different labs. And one of them is testing albumin. And if albumin's low, that's an indication potentially that something might be going on with your liver. Just fun fact, kind of getting your critical thinking going. That's not going to be on the quiz, but it's just for higher learning. So with the paracentesis, unfortunately, we get um, our largest cavity in our body is our abdominal cavity. So fluid starts to leak into our abdominal cavity and it can, um, we can, I mean, drain four to five liters out of there. It's a lot. If you think about it, um, it's a large looming needle that's stuck into the abdominal cavity, uh, via ultrasound. It usually takes about an hour or so. And you want to be really careful, of course, with nursing assessment for orthostatic hypotension and making sure that the patient's safe. Um, and usually the most that they'll take out, I've never heard of them taking out more than five to six liters at a time for that reason. Um, it's palliative care, helps um, take pressure off the lungs if they're laying on their back um, and whatnot. So that's just kind of the, I know it seemed like the long version, but that's a short version of what a paracentesis is. So which of one of these things will mean that I explained things correctly when I was teaching? Letter A, I will be in surgery in... I'm sorry, I may have typed that wrong for less than one hour. Um, that would not be correct because this is not a surgery. It is a procedure. Letter B, I must not avoid, they'll be awake, meaning um, they'll be completely awake during the procedure. Letter B, I must not avoid prior to the procedure. We do want them to avoid because we want um, everything down as low as possible because we, of course, we don't want to um, puncture the bladder or have more um, room being taken up in the abdominal cavity before the paracentesis. So B would not be uh, correct. C, the physician will remove two to three liters of fluid. That could be absolutely correct. It doesn't always have to be four, five, or six. And again, I've never heard of more than six being taken out. I would say four to five being more the average, but still this, this is correct saying, okay, we're going to remove two to three liters of fluid. And then letter D, I will lie on my back and breathe slowly. So a lot of students do like this one. Um, laying on your back can be difficult for breathing purposes because I, I, myself, I've never been pregnant, but if you have, and, or know someone that's been pregnant, or you can just imagine having a, a big, I mean, 30 pounds of fluid in your abdominal cavity. I mean, I've had patients lose, uh, like 35 pounds over like four months getting paracentesis done recently, actually about two, maybe it was like three, four months ago, I had a patient that did this, um, over a course of time and we would weigh him weekly and he would usually lose about like seven pounds in like four, like 10 days. So, um, normally they don't have you lay on your back. You'll lay on your side. Um, although I will just say this and I don't want to confuse anybody. I, I have had, I've ask patients like, oh, what position did they put you in? And they did put them on their back. But in, again, if you can only pick one answer, what is the most correct, the most correct answer of, we're talking about a pad of paracentesis and what is the best teaching of, um, that has been successful is what they're actually going to be doing in the procedure is the physician will remove two to three liters of fluid. Because again, normally they don't have them lie on their back because it's uncomfortable for their um, breathing. Okay, so I hope that that um, was helpful. And again, please know those questions and those answers. And if you have any questions in class, um, please feel free to just jot them down and ask me. So we are going to now move on to the Quizlet questions. There's 10 of them, and that is part of the review as well. And then we're done. So just one moment. So moving on to our next part, we're going to be um, going over um, in, bre in brevity, um, the other parts of your quiz. So if you notice on your quiz review for the next quiz, I think it's quiz three. I'm sorry, I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure it's quiz three um, that you're going to be having very soon or not very soon, but somewhat soon. There are, I believe, 10 bullet points, if I, if I recall correctly. And if you notice, the quiz is 10 points. And I give you basically... I mean, literally go over everything. So um, th this is kind of a, what I would call, I don't want to say a freebie. Um, I did this for Mission College as well. Kind of a, just a, it's been a, a rough couple, couple of weeks. Let's, you know, you guys have had a lot of stuff with addiction. Let's kind of, you know, have a little bit of a relax uh, quiz, if you will. <laughs> so, okay. 
let's go over this and then i'll look at my um we'll look over the review sheet real brief just to make sure that i didn't miss anything so what neurotransmitter is most closely related to addiction um we should all know that that would be a lot of people end up saying serotonin, it is dopamine. So we know that dopamine in the reward pathway, when that is ignited by something that could potentially be addictive and or habit forming, when dopamine is released by the VTA in the reward pathway, that ignites euphoria. And then the euphoria ignites the reward. And then the reward is what makes you want to reinforce it and have you do it again. So what neurotransmitter is most closely related to addiction? That answer to that would be dopamine. Next is, and I know this is kind of an interesting way to word it, but where I just have always said it like this, where in the brain, and there are different ways to answer, limbic system, I mean, this, that, the other. Reward pathway is what I ask. So I try to stick with one verbiage, but reward circuit, reward pathway, limbic system, limbic area, mesolimbic pathway. There's so many different I just like to stick to one. So where does addiction live or where in the brain is, okay, this is not English. Where in the brain does addiction live? It lives in the reward pathway. So that is important to know. The functions of the frontal lobe that interact closely with addiction. So we've talked about the frontal lobe in previous um, discussions briefly. And there was a reason, because as I mentioned, there's a method to the madness. It connects to this. So of course, the frontal lobe does several things, but there are three distinct things that the frontal lobe does and that can impair judgment with, um, and it, it, we'll talk about this on the Jeopardy, because um, there's going to be some questions that come up that we have not talked about. And again, Jeopardy, it's more of me, um, it helps me guide the class rather than us playing it, because on Zoom, it's just, it's, it's impossible. In person, we would actually play. So you'll see how we'll, I think we may have played the other Jeopardy, so we've done this before. So um, frontal lobe, uh, three things that are important to know in relation to addiction, as far as frontal lobe function would be impulsivity. It helps to control impulsivity, critical thinking, and judgment. Those three things. Next vulnerabilities to addiction. Of course, there are several. I'm going to explain four of them. Um, one being a 50% genetic risk. And I say risk for a very um, specific reason. And hopefully on Friday we'll have, yeah, we will have probably about 10 minutes to watch this particular nurse um, explain, or sorry, not nurse. Um, uh, he's like a PhD in science. He's brilliant. And I really like him. I not as familiar with him as I am with some of the other scientists, but he explains the addiction and um, the genetic part, because I think it's very important for us to understand that, especially for those who have kids or want kids and hearing that can be very anxiety ridden. Plus I, I just personally, I don't explain it very well. And I, I know where my weaknesses are, and that is just one thing I don't explain well. So why not use our resources? So um, I'm going to make a note of that because they did show Mission College, and it was very helpful for them. So I'll do that for you as well. So uh, first vulnerability would be a 50%. Ge it's genetics. You don't have to say genetic risk. I like to say it, um, but 50% genetic, childhood trauma, um, mental health diagnoses, or you can either say environment or I say chronic, chronic stress. So chronic, chronic stress. So if you see on a quiz or if I ask you, what are the four vulnerabilities or true or false? Are these the four vulnerabilities? 50% genetics, childhood trauma, um, mental health diagnoses and chronic, chronic stress. That would be correct. And I'll explain more in detail um, on Friday why not just I'll actually explain physically why so you'll learn the genetic component from the video and then the other ones like from me in our bodies how that actually changes um, the trajectory of our brain um, I'll go into detail because I think that makes it a little bit more tangible do medications exist to help one assist in his or her recovery 
Absolutely. And that is a video that I um, am still needing to make and it will be posted. Don't worry uh, before your final. And it is, I'm actually making it for both you and mission, same one, because I'm doing pretty much almost the exact same addiction lectures for both of you guys. Um, you guys are just a week behind them. Um, cause we do a little bit of different things cause you are BSN and they're ADN. Um, so, uh, for medications, all you need to know right now is yes, there are medications that can help with anti-craving, um, medications or help in one's recovery. So use, abuse, and addiction, I'm not really going to go over this, but um, it just, I like this explanation and I give this explanation a lot because there is a difference. And I wish so very much it was like a rash, right? Like there was a line on your body, something could happen where I could say, see, you do have addiction because there is so much denial. There's so much of this. It's very, very hard to, or it can be very difficult to, to say, yes, I drink, you know, um, 1.75 liters of vodka a day. I mean, it's, that's not something that's easy to admit. And, um, so I just like to point out that there is a difference between somebody using alcohol, meaning, oh, you know, I'm at a wedding, it's a Friday night dinner, a glass of wine with dinner once, a, you know, just, but I think you get what I'm trying to say. Then there's abuse where, um, you know, and I'm not saying somebody that, oh my God, I had a bad day. I'm going to go home and have a glass of wine. Oh my God, I need to relax. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm more talking about binges, um, drinking excessive amounts to cope with all the problems, every single problem. Of course, I'm sure many people who are listening to this have done, you know, now marijuana is legal, you know, there's, so there's, there is a difference. And I, I know I don't have to go into detail because I'm pretty sure you all understand. If you don't, please ask. Then somewhere along that line, it can switch into addiction. And addiction is where, and this is where it can become difficult. Of course, how do we actually, this is very important because this is on your quiz. How do you actually diagnose it? So of course you assess, but where does the actual diagnosis come from? The DSM-5. That's where the diagnosis comes from. So I can't just sit there, like I've said about everything else and say, oh, you have depression, you have this. You must fit a certain criteria in order to say, okay, you fit the criteria for addiction. One last thing I want to say about this is, and this is a quick way that I usually would, I, I can explain it, usually has to do with how is this impairing your life? Because for a long time, some people can go as a very functional person who is, um, I don't, I don't like to say the word, oh, you're an alcoholic. That's like saying you're a diabetic. So somebody with alcohol use disorder, um, can be extremely functional. Nobody could know until it's not. And, and a lot of the time there's just only so much time. It, it could be 10 years. You're drinking a ton. You sober up, you take benzos in the morning to make it, whatever you're doing to make it functional, you're functional. And, and, and usually then the bricks start falling around around you, right? Husband, wife, kids threaten to leave you, or you start not being able to meet deadlines at work, things like that. So your life is, is truly affected. There are consequences, DUIs, things like that. That's another thing that I look at with addiction. Of course, the DSM gives the true diagnosis. So that's how it's diagnosed. Um, tolerance and link with the frontal lobe. So what happens is, um, as you watch I forget when it's due, so you may not, I, oh, what I've created. No, yeah, you, uh, many of you have watched it. I think it's actually due, like, possibly today, is what happens with your frontal lobe is eventually once you've taken in so much alcohol or so much methamphetamine or so much of something that's giving you so much dopamine, your brain just says, I don't need to make it anymore. There's three ways, but I'm just going to say this for now. Um, because we'll talk more about it in Jeopardy because it's kind of nicer to have you here and I want to make this as short as possible um, so that you'll listen to the whole thing hopefully and get 100% on your quiz. And so what happens is your brain just says, I don't need to make it anymore. You're giving me dopamine because you're, you are, you're, let's say alcohol, you're, you're, you're drinking copious amounts of alcohol. You're giving me the dopamine that I need. I want to conserve energy. I'm not going to make it anymore. That's detrimental for many reasons, but one one big detriment to it is remember how earlier we talked about your frontal lobe. So if your frontal lobe helps with 
impulsivity, judgment, and critical thinking, that happens because of dopamine receptors. So dopamine goes into those receptors and it helps with those three things. So if we have a lack of dopamine, don't you think it's going to be hard for somebody to, that is that has a lack of dopamine that might be um, have an addiction to be able to make a good decision, have critical thinking, and not be impulsive? So the, these are the behaviors that we start to see. This is not an excuse. It's, it's an understanding of just like someone that has depression, their serotonin is off kilter or, or and all of this stuff, right? So I just want you to, we'll talk more about that on Friday, but it's a very interesting, it's a brain dysfunction. And um, it's, I mean, this is all evidence-based by the way, um, by PET scans and functional MRIs. Number eight, substance use disorder versus process addiction. Um, this is important. So the difference would be um, exactly what it says. So substances would be alcohol, methamphetamines, cocaine, marijuana, LSD. Those are all substances. Process addiction has to do with um, food addiction, sex addiction, pornography, exercise, masturbation. Um, trying to think of the most popular ones. Uh, gaming, those are all process addiction. Please make sure you know that. What is considered an excessive amount? We don't need to go over that. True or false, is heroin an opiate? You do need to know this. Please know this. So um, heroin is considered an opiate. Some people don't know that. So I thought I would just throw that in there. So the answer would be true. Heroin is an opiate. It goes to the opiate receptor. Something that goes to the opiate receptor we know can be potentially habit forming. So we know that heroin goes to that opiate receptor. It's stimulated. And then if it's potentially habit forming, it goes to the reward pathway. It ignites dopamine in the VTA, which gives you euphoria, which equals a reward, which equals reinforcement. Okay, so that's all of that one. Now let's just look at our um, review sheet real quick to make sure that we did not miss anything. Alrighty, so this is exactly what you already have, but let's just make sure that we, oops, sorry, it's a little to the, whoop, there we go. <laughs> so you already have this um, for your study guide. So um, right here, so as I mentioned, please know the three NCLEX questions that we, that we went over. Um, and again, if you have questions on that, please feel free to jot them down and I would be happy to answer them for you on Friday or um, text me or whatnot if you're not in class. I know some of you are going to be helping out Joey, I believe. Um, so you won't be there. Uh, next question, what part of the brain releases dopamine when something has the potential to be habit forming? Where does addiction live? We already talked about that. Where does addiction live? In the reward pathway. The frontal lobe, name three functions, impulsivity or controlling impulsivity, but even if you were impulsivity, I would, that's fine. Um, impulsivity, critical thinking, and um, judgment. Full, four vulnerabilities of addiction, 50% genetics, or you don't even have to write that. For, you could just say genetics. Um, and if I asked you a specific percentage, I would, I would have written that. In, as the question. So you can say genetics, um, childhood trauma, mental illness, mental health diagnosis, something in that realm, and chronic, chronic stress. And when I say chronic, chronic twice, this is a true or false question. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I, because I explain it like that, chronic, chronic, <laughs> it will say both. So it's not a trick. Do anti-craving medications exist for alcohol use and opiate use, but not for stimulants. That is correct. So we did not go over that in the Quizlet. So unfortunately, um, we have not yet come up with anything that is FDA approved for amphetamine use disorder, stimulant, so stimulant use disorders. So alcohol and opiates are the only two um, disorders or sorry, use disorders that have medications that can help with cravings. So that's important to know. How is addiction diagnosed? DSM, right? That's how it's actually diagnosed. Of course you assess. That's why I'm giving you a little more information about it because that, that question is a little confusing. So I underlined diagnosed and I said, 
And I'm telling you right now, how do you actually get the diagnoses? You ask, but then it's a DSM that's actually giving you the diagnoses. So the DSM, process addictions, sex, masturbation, pornography, um, food, gaming, gambling, um, heroin is in which category of drugs? We just talked about that. It's an opiate and that is it. So if you prepare and watch this, you are going to get hundred percent and I will see you guys very soon. Thank you for watching and please feel free to ask any questions for clarification if needed. I hope you have a, whenever you're watching this, good rest of that day. Thank you.